pictures. Are they bad? No. They're too good. I'm sorry, but it, it stretches credulity that you could have taken these photos. The origins of dim light actually um, come at about 35,000 feet above sea level. Uh, I was flying back from Germany and I had a little notebook with me and I decided I was going to do a little exercise. I was going to just do a brain dump of every idea I'd ever had that could be a film. And one of those things that I wrote down on that piece of paper was if blind people saw some alternate reality, what might that be? And that's really where the idea of dim light came from. And it started out as it was going to be really short and we're going to do it like on a weekend and like it just sort of like grew and became this beast over time. So Well, Neil originally came to me uh, with his original script just to uh, see what I thought of it. And I was, you know, immediately attracted to this, you know, supernatural superhero story uh, that had a real, you know, human foundation in, in loss and, and dealing with loss and grief. My sister is actually the one who introduced me to the work of Kevin Carter. She saw this gut-wrenching photo of a kid in Africa starving to death. That story really just stayed with me. The power of media to capture but then not always being able to fix. As a director of photography, the visuals always really interest me, but I also try to keep in mind what the story has to say as well. So a uh, dim light I think really has the best of both worlds. Well, when I read the character description, it interested me because that's the type of role that's actually a little bit more difficult for me. Casting for Asia was really tricky because we had so many people come in to read for the role. And Anna East Fairweather was the first one I felt that really got the character and accomplished the entire arc of the scene just on her first read through. It was pretty, pretty, pretty phenomenal. It was an intense scene. It was an intense audition. When I walked out, I felt like, I have to get this, you know? That's it. I had somebody in mind to play Craig, and uh, it was a, a wonderful actor called Ralph Guzzo that I'd worked with before. Working with uh, Anais and Ralph Guzzo uh, was amazing and just exceeded our expectations at every turn. He came in at the end of the day after we'd seen everybody else and hadn't looked at the script, took 15 minutes with it outside, came in and just blew us all away. It was just immediately self-evident that he understood the character, that he got the piece, and uh, yeah, it, it all ended up working out. It, just, it was just one of those great things where you, you have a hunch and it turns out to be right. He was totally the right guy for the job. In 15, take one. Mark. Marker. Crewing up is actually like one of my most favorite things to do as a producer because I love calling people up and finding the best person for a job, so it's essentially the USC Mafia. I mean, I really enjoyed working on the OR with him. I was excited to have the chance to do it again. We worked on two projects before. We play really well off each other, throwing ideas and then destroying those ideas or approving those ideas. Neil was that, uh, that fat kid in fifth grade that always uh, competed with me on the spelling tests. We were kind of rivals, and then we decided about when we were in seventh grade, if you can't beat him, join him. I mean, it, it, he never asked me, will you do the music for this? It's just always Im is implied. I don't really do a project unless I know that I'm gonna enjoy working on it, and I knew from the first watch I couldn't turn this down. The thing that is awesome about working with Neil is he is so passionate. I think it should be mentioned that the night before we started shooting, it was pouring rain and Neil got in a car wreck. And he called me at like three in the morning, my phone rang, I was asleep. And he's like, hey man, don't freak out, but like, I kind of like in a car accident, but it's all good, like don't worry, we're gonna shoot like straight up tomorrow morning. And I was like, are you like in the hospital? Like what's wrong? He's like, don't worry about it, it's all good, man. It's all, don't worry, I'll take care of it after the film. He's like, you know, and he's like limping, he's like limping a little, he's like, oh, don't worry about the leg, I'll heal later, like we gotta film now. Fortunately, we were able to get a hold of a Red One camera. At the time, it was a fairly new technology. It's still a new technology. Essentially, the entire film was shot in two and a half days. We were just hammering things out. Dave had less than 20 minutes to set up the camera and the lights every time, and he did it. On the first day, we're hoping for blue skies, and it starts ranging from a slight trickle to raining cats and dogs. And it actually ended up, I think, making the shot even richer than we originally imagined it. I relied a lot on the photos. I think they were one of my favorite parts of the production design because 
they really told a lot about Craig. You know, he's a photographer, so the photos are his life. So I knew from the start that I wanted to have like huge printed photos of his travels on the walls. It's basically two people in a room, so there's not a whole lot of crazy action going on. But there is a there is an interesting visual element that comes into play when you do the whole dim light vision and flashbacks. And there's a lot of room to really go with a, a an unorthodox visual style in something that could very well be just traditionally shot. The idea for the way he sees um, actually came to me when I was talking to somebody about MP3s. You know, the way MP3 technology works is, is that it takes an audio file and essentially deletes everything away but the loudest sounds, the things that the human ear would pick out the most is the only things that it keeps. And I just apply that same logic to vision. If we only see the loudest images, if all of a sudden all that got taken away from us, what might we see? Working with Ralph. <laughs> Every time I think about it, I just picture him eating out of that damn tuna can and me trying so hard to take it seriously because he just like with his fork and you know, and it smelled and then he had some on his lips and I was like, he gets so into the character that he'll just pick up whatever's near him if he feels like an improvise and start drinking. So there were definitely a few times where he was drinking beer on set. Um. Every time he'd open that door, I just never knew what to expect. Is he going to try and kill me? Is he going to embrace me? Is he going to scare the crap out of me? Who knows? Craig, yes. it's Asia. I need to show you something. Can I come in? No. And God's crying! <laughs> and there was moments where I felt like we really were connected. I think those are always the most rewarding parts. There's a certain language that a lot of directors, I think, have a hard time really grasping. Um, and Neil knows what buttons to press with an actor to get what you need from the scene. There was this part where I had to say the last lines, you know, and Neil said, you're witnessing a miracle. And it's just like the way the words he uses just speak so well to the actors. And so Neil's great. I had a great time with him, especially when the, the cameras weren't rolling. Lunch, Neil has some good stories. <laughs> I think originally uh, reading the script and being on set, the film I saw was not what we actually ended up doing. As we cut, I saw these opportunities that you just don't see on set. There was this one take that was, uh, I think everybody took a lot of pride in, there was a, a tilting shot upward as the character of Craig drank some coffee. But we never really found an opportunity to put it into the film. And as we were trying to find a way to give the film sort of a, a narrative bookend, uh, we realized we could use this shot in two different takes, in the beginning and the end. So we had a, a moment where we had Craig on his own in his apartment before he meets Asia. And then in the end, after Asia left, it was a, it was a good bookend to see him alone again on his own. And that, that was something that I don't think anybody saw coming until we cut it in. Um, John Evans uh, was a sound designer on uh, Dim Light. I was working with Sean Chapman, Tim Herzog, and Eric Denniston. And uh, we were in production for about three months. Through the night session, 16 hours, 12 hours straight in the studio. But that's what you gotta do to make the product happen. So that's what we did. There's so many delicious little tidbits in the film. Anybody that watches it is definitely gonna be surprised. I've often said that I pretty much just make movies so other people will make music for them. Uh, the fun thing for a composer is we actually get to take uh, a real role in the storytelling process. I'm very lucky to uh, be best friends with my composer, Jay Vincent. The guy is just unbelievably gifted and he has such a range um, and, and there's really nothing he can't do. Elmer Bernstein said that his approach is you, you say whatever the film isn't saying already. This whole still waters run deep kind of filmmaking. Uh, you know, Niels, Niels, he's a very humanistic type of guy and that's why the two of us work so well together because everything is more than it seems. It's more than just what's on the surface. Every, everything a character says is indicative of where they are in their process as a human being. Especially, you know, because this is a short film with, let's face it, a limited budget. We can't afford like a 95-piece orchestra. 
So you use a very limited canvas, like this string quintet and this piano, but you get the most out of it as you possibly can. So uh, the way that I wanted to handle uh, Craig and Asia musically, it's not, um, you know, it's not, it, it's, it's about them connecting, but it's not about them being very intimate with each other. It's not about them falling in love. So I never wanted it to be, because uh, most composers would feel the temptation is like, oh, if he's this instrument and she's this instrument, then I'm going to play them together and it's going to be all like, I mean, it's not, it's not as simple as that. This film is not that simple. Neil's not that simple of a, of a filmmaker. Um, so I wanted, you know, rather than having like this beautiful love duet like from La Boheme where they're all harmonizing together because they're, you know, right on the same wavelength, it's not going to be like that at all. It's going to be more like uh, Carmen when they're singing simultaneously, but they're never singing together, if that makes any sense. It's 7.03. We just spent uh, 11 hours mixing down dim light and uh, we just put the tail and head sink on this thing and we're hoping, praying that we're finished. The best thing about, you know, about doing this movie is just that I get to finish the story that he wants to tell. So it has a very intriguing story, interesting characters. It was a really intense weekend, lots of events packed into three days or four days, but it turned out really well. The choices that we've made, we could have never foreseen, but have made all the difference in the world. I set out to, you know, make a make a roller coaster ride that's still a character piece. And I hope I accomplish that. I think there's a there's a quote from from Karate Kid. It says where Mr. Mr. Miyagi says, uh, "Win or lose, no matter. Make good fight, earn respect." And I think that's what we're doing. You know, we're we're throwing down. We're doing the best we can and putting our best foot forward and kind of telling the world like, "Hey, this is who we are," and like, look at our stuff and. Uh, so I'm confident it's going to do really well. I think this film is going to dominate.